I, uh, even though I talk for a living, I haven't always had an easy time uh, doing this, talking, I mean, um, and if you've heard this story before in another setting, forgive me, but when I was uh, about my son's age, maybe four or five years old, I had a pretty heavy speech impediment. It meant that I would say words a little bit differently. Um, Captain Crunch was tapped in flunch, um, things like that, you know, and I went in, into speech um, classes when I was in kindergarten and first grade. Um, it's always good when you get, you know, named and pulled out of your class because something about you is different, like really, really good. Um, that was great. Uh, it was the 90s. We were still figuring stuff out back then. It's good. It's good. Um, and, hey, where's the kids that can't talk good? Yeah, you too. Come here. You know, um, anyways. Uh, sorry, class. Sorry, class. We need these two. Um, anyways, uh, it's fine. It's fine. Talk to my therapist. Um, <laughs> So my aunt was picking me up from school one day, and I was telling her about my lunch. And uh, I said, Aunt Debbie, I really, I yiked my yunch uh, a lot, uh, yacht. And um, she said, oh, what did you have for lunch? I was telling her about this. And then I said, I had fwing seeds. I had fwing seeds for lunch. And she said, fwing seeds? Scott, fwing seeds? I said, no, Aunt Debbie, fwing seeds. She said, Scott, it sounds like you're saying fwing seeds, and I'm getting so angry. Aunt Debbie, no, fwing seeds. Weed my whips, Aunt Debbie. <laughs> fwing seeds. Yike a wope, Aunt Debbie. And she thinks and goes, oh, string cheese. Yes, string cheese. I said, yes, Aunt Debbie, fwing seeds. I identify with Moses as one who's called to leadership, but also had to struggle through, right? Um, I get it. I really do get it. Um, you know, our mouths can take training. I, I did. I had to do a good amount of speech training. I still get stuck on a word from time to time, um, from latent stutters and whatnot. Um, our, our, our mouths, our voices can take training. It takes a lot of training to sound as beautiful as um, our choir. Um, and, uh, and, and our voices, our mouths, they, they contain a lot of power. Um, they're incredibly powerful, and they could be, I think, a window into a deeper sense of faith. T today, we're continuing in a series called Body and Soul, and it's a series that we are uh, working through during this season of Lent. If this is your first time experiencing Lent, welcome. Uh, it's a season of preparation in many Christian traditions where we um, spend a season, several weeks, in preparation for Easter, uh, in the same way that Advent prepares us for Christmas. And so we're focusing on embodiment this year here uh, at AUMC. And last week, we talked about our ears and our ability to listen and hear. And, and this week, let's talk about our mouths and our voices and the power that they possess. So you heard a moment ago, um, uh, Britt Melrose reading Psalm 51, selections from Psalm 51. Uh, the interesting thing about Psalm 51 is so, so many psalms have sort of a generalized occasion, right? A psalm for praise or a psalm of lament, Psalm 51 is very specific. Psalm 51 was written as King David speaking after he had just been confronted by Nathaniel in 2 Samuel or in 1 Samuel 12, right? That's a very specific occasion. Um, it's meant to be almost like uh, an insertion into that story of 1 Samuel that in what is a moment in that story becomes this, this long, beautiful, and painful song that David sings internally. That's the occasion for this psalm. So to, before we can even talk about the psalm, we're not going to talk about the psalm until like the last three minutes of the sermon today. Instead, we're going to talk mostly about the story that is the foundation of the psalm because you can't understand the psalm until you understand the story. 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel are um, the two books that chronicle the sort of life and time and era of the Davidic dynasty, the dynasty of King David in Israel. Um, to a little bit of background on who David was. David was born in Bethlehem about a thousand years before Jesus in, in somewhere around 1040 BCE. Uh, Bethlehem, the same birthplace as Matthew says Jesus was born. You'll see a lot in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, that tries to connect the Jesus story with the David story because David was something of the golden child, uh, the golden era of the people of Israel. He began his life as a shepherd, uh, right? A little bit of connection there. 
there. And, he, and he's very famous, of course, if you ever went to Sunday school or even if you didn't, he's famous for killing Goliath, the giant Philistine, right? He, he Goliath, this big, scary guy, and all David, the little shepherd boy, had a little sling, and he, and he killed him with one stone, and, and he became really famous for that. He was also someone who learned how to find political power quickly. He was best friends with the son of King Saul. You know, depending on how you read the story, they were more than friends, you know. Uh, I can imagine his grandmother saying, oh, Edna, no, that's just David's special, they're just special friends. They're just special friends that just always hang out with each other and confess their love to one another and are definitely more than friends if you actually read the Bible. Um, So yeah, David is best friends and perhaps more with King Saul's son, Jonathan. And then after King Saul dies, David becomes the military leader and ruler over the southern kingdom of Judah, uh, and then unites all 12 tribes of Israel, establishes the capital city of Jerusalem, brings the Ark of the Covenant there, expands their boundaries and borders through military conquest. This is King David. Hurrah. This is a people that had never had that kind of sense of central nationality and central identity, and David grants them that, granted through violence and war. But David is a strong man leader, and he is seen as sort of the golden era by the time Jesus comes around. To think of King David was to think of something short of perfection. And yet, 1 Samuel 11 shows us how even the most celebrated, even the most revered, are also extremely, extremely prone to corruption and sin and evil. 1 Samuel 11 is a dark story about a woman named Bathsheba and her husband Uriah. And I'll paraphrase it now. It's too long to read in its entirety. So David is up one night, and he's looking out um, at the rooftops, and he sees a woman bathing at night on her rooftop. Her name is Bathsheba. And before we get in, before you go there and think like, well, what is she doing? It's actually what she's doing is she's abiding by the ritual traditions of her time. It, she was menstruating and as such was unclean to be around the rest of her family. So she had to go through these cleansing rituals up on top of her roof where she wouldn't be uh, accidentally making the rest of her family impure. And that's why David sees her. David is uh, immediately taken with her beauty. He commands his guards to go and bring her to him. Um, She comes to to him. He commands that they sleep together. They do. She goes home to Uriah. She comes back a little while later, tells David that she's pregnant. And then David goes to get her husband, uh, brings him to to David, and David says, "Um, why don't you go and spend the night with your wife before you go to war? And Uriah pushes back and says no. So David's unable to cover up the affair. And then he says, aha, I know what I'll do to get out of this predicament. I'll just send Uriah to the front line of battle so he dies. And that's what he does. He commands that Uriah, this very honorable and, and, and respectful man, to go to the front lines of battle in the war that he is waging, and Uriah dies. And Bathsheba is grief-stricken, and she's carrying David's child, and that is 1 Samuel 11. When I was reading this story for a, a, a second, a third, a fourth time this week, especially considering the theme of words and the theme of our mouths and the way that our mouths can be tools for good and for bad, I realized something in this story, and that is that David does almost all of his evil because of the words that he uses. He commands his soldiers to go and bring Bathsheba to him. He commands that she sleep with him. He then sends her home. He then orders her husband to him. He tries to get Uriah to do something against his will. Uriah proves to be righteous and is punished as a result, and he commands that Uriah be sent to the front line. David barely has to lift a finger to wreak all of this havoc in the life of Bathsheba, in the life of Uriah, in the life of his people. The words that David uses cause so much harm in this story. And it's, it's a story that we can look at and say, oh, David is so bad. What a bad person to do such bad, evil, awful things. 
And yet, I wonder if I had a 1 Samuel 11 printout in my life of the ways in which my words had caused harm in the lives of those around me. See, the thing about harmful words is they're really easy to keep in the shadows. When we talk bad about someone behind their back, when we spread gossip, when we lose our temper even with people that we love, we might think that that's just an isolated incident and we may not even think another thing of it. But I think what David's story shows me is that the words that we use can actually have incredibly damaging, lifelong lasting, harmful effects. And I wonder if I knew the kind of damage that my words could do, would I think differently about the words that I speak? If I could see the rest of the story, so when I spread that piece of gossip that I don't really know is true, and then somehow it ends up impacting and affecting that person's lived reality, mental health, etc. would that make me think differently about how I'm choosing to use my words? Talking bad about someone behind their back and, and cutting them down without having the courage to actually confront them directly. If I knew the impact that could have on an entire system of people, would I still use my words the same way? If me losing my temper with someone that I work with or, with or someone that I love and I write it off as, oh, I was just in a bad mood, if I could see the actual impact that has as they then have another interaction and another interaction all the way down the line, would that change the way that I use my words? I, I'm starting us low, friends, and I promise we're going to pick it up from here, but I need us to see before we talk about how much power and how much encouragement we can offer with our words, I need us to see the damage that we can do first, because our mouths and our words can do a whole lot of harm if we're not careful. How might our words change if we could see and know their lasting power? Now let's talk about someone who uses his voice for good. Chapter 12, we turn the page and we um, see a man named Nathan. And Nathan is this sort of wise sage figure for David. Uh, think of the way that Moses speaks truth to Pharaoh. Nathan is going to speak truth to David. He's something of, a, of an intermediary, a conduit for God with this ruler. And, and, and Nathan sees what all has happened. And he goes to David and said, says, David, can I tell you a story? And David says, yeah, he says, guess what happened in your kingdom? There was a man, a wealthy man. There's a man in your kingdom who has all these sheep, but he's hungry and he, did, and he didn't want to slaughter one of his own sheep. So he goes and finds a poor neighbor and, and that poor neighbor only has one sheep. And he goes to that poor neighbor and he takes his one sheep and he, and he slaughters that sheep and, and that's the sheep that he has. And, and, the, and now the poor neighbor is left with nothing and the rich man was too greedy uh, to even uh, think of his own sheep first. And, uh, and, and, and David is just getting incensed and, and says, find this, I, I want this man right now. I want his head, he's dead. And Nathan says, that man is you. And immediately David realizes that what Nathan has been sharing is a metaphor for David to understand the kind of damage that he has done. He points out that the selfish, the greedy, the inhumane, um, the, the murderous, the, the, the everything you can latch onto that story, all of that is in his own heart. And, and he realizes that the person he hates in that moment is himself. Now, Nathan risks a lot by having this conversation, right? David's a military conquester, right? I, I would imagine he was prone to uh, fits of anger, don't you think? I don't think you become a high-ranking military effect, uh, official like David in those days specifically without being someone that could be prone to aggression. And he knows that he's coming to David in a time of a, of a measurable sort of grief and chaos and stress in David's life. And, and it would be so much easier for him to keep his well-appointed court official job that probably has a nice pay, pay, pay period and, or a pay salary, and he's probably got retirement benefits out the wazoo. And he could, if he just stayed quiet, that would all be okay. But if he opens his mouth, it could be him sent to the front lines next. But Nathan does what he should. He, he opens his mouth. He says the hard thing. He trusts David enough to share a really painful, really hard truth with him. That's the gift that Nathan brings to this story. 
In Psalm 51, we then see is that turning point moment where David receives the truth that Nathan has shared and allows it to convict his spirit, to allows him to, um, to confess his sins and allows him to repent, to turn towards the righteousness and justice of God and to begin to repair and bring healing to all the damage that he has done. That conversation between Nathan and David becomes an inflection point, a turning point from sin to righteousness in David's life. Uh, my friends, the, 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 the truth is this, courageous conversations can be the start of a healing journey. Those of us who say that we are committed to healing and want healing for ourselves or for our community or for our loved ones or for our nation or you fill in the, the blank, I know this to be true, courageous conversations can be the start of that healing journey. That's because, you know, it's a cliche, but it's true. Communication is key in any relationship. Open channels of communication are key. It's, it's what allows uh, healthy marriages to survive the long haul. It's what allows friendships to, to maintain and survive really challenging seasons. It's what allows for healthy workplace environments, healthy community environments. If you cannot be open and honest in your communication, it's going to be hard to generate health. You cannot heal what you cannot talk about. If Nathan had stayed quiet and David thought that what he had done, just done was permissible, can you imagine what David would do next? You cannot heal what you cannot talk about. It's one of the reasons why I am so grateful this church is not an echo chamber church where we say we don't want to talk about things that make us uncomfortable. It's not a church where we, we, we try to silence anything that makes people uncomfortable, but rather where we try to generate the conversations that can make people uncomfortable, but we know it's the conversation that is going to stand between us and a path of healing. So we have to talk about stuff that's hard here. If we can't talk about stuff that's hard at church, where the heck can we talk about stuff? And for those of us who, who are praying and working towards a better lived reality in this country as it's related to racism or sexism or women's rights or, or trans rights or LGBTQ rights or, or about you fill in the blank here, economic justice, uh, whatever it is, Christian nationalism, if we think we can do that without opening up our hands and trying to start a conversation with someone that we deeply disagree with, then, then we're just plain wrong. We're not going to strongman our way through this one. David's a military leader. He can't strong arm his way through his problems. We can't strongman our way through our problems. We have to be willing to have courageous conversations, open, honest conversations at the micro, at the macro level, if we want to walk a path of healing. Now, the one caveat I'm going to add to this is I'm not telling you you have to keep channels of communication open when they become abusive or harmful or toxic. Somebody say amen, okay? Because someone's going to walk out of here and, and they're going to say, well, I heard my preacher say, I got to leave the channel of communication open. So they're going to leave a channel of communication open with someone who is abusing them or someone who wants to harm them or someone who just straight up doesn't respect them. That's not what I'm saying, right? Some of us, the, help, the healing journey has been saying, uh, this channel of communication is closed, Right? That's been part of the healing journey. I think we can carve with a scalpel and understand that, that what we are talking about today is, is nuanced and is, is more about our general approach to people in our lives and not the specific examples of when communication gets harmful or abusive or toxic. You with me? I don't know if you are. Are you with me, friends? Okay. You had me scared there for a second. You know, talking about the power of words and voices, I notice someone who has none in this story. It's really hard to read this story and, and to not notice the fact that Bathsheba never once is allowed to speak. Bathsheba, the woman who is in many ways at the center of this story, the woman who is abused, sexually assaulted, who is forgotten and treated as nothing more than a, than a possession. We are told that she grieves. We're told that she mourns, but we never get to hear a word come out of her mouth, and we never get to know what her voice sounds like. We don't hear her fear when she's summoned by the king. We don't hear her pain when she returns home to her husband. We don't hear her terror when telling David that she is pregnant. We don't hear her weeping when Uriah is killed, she is silenced. And reading this story today, I, I think about all the people who are still silenced uh, in this moment in 2024. Here we are 3,000 years later. 
And we still have Bathshebas in our land who, who are not able to have their voices heard for this, that, or another reason. And it brings me back to the person of Nathan and the fact that he was willing to lift his voice in that moment when Bathsheba was not in a position to lift her own. And it makes me think about how many of us have voices, and, and I'm going to just use me language, how often I have a voice and I choose not to use it, and I tell myself this lie. Here's the lie. Well, I just want to listen. I just want to listen more. I want to gain more information. I don't want to jump to conclusions. I want to make a well-informed, thoughtful decision. And none of those things are bad. Hear me clearly. Please listen. Please learn. Please make well-informed, thoughtful decisions. Please get as many facts as you can before lifting your voice. But by God, at some point, we cross that line from listening to just being silent. I do it. And I know you do it. And, and, and we all do it. This is not a time for us to shame or guilt trip, but to simply name a reality that sometimes we weaponize silence and say, well, I just want to listen or I just want to be thoughtful, when the reality is we're just, we're just scared of speaking up. But the reality is there are those who literally can't. Bathsheba can't pick up the pen from the author and write in her words. And so Nathan has to speak on her behalf. And sometimes in lives, my friends, we have got to be willing to risk our own skin when it's not our problem, but it needs to be. And so we speak up and we give voice to someone else who is silenced. And maybe all we need to say is we need to listen to them. Maybe that's all you need to say. We need to listen to them. But if we don't, then the silence is deafening. So one of the faithful questions we have to ask is, how long do I listen? And at what point am I just choosing to remain silent? And now we finally find our way to Psalm 51. Nathan confronts David. David has this internal monologue. And he talks about God's spirit cleansing, himself, cleansing his self. He says, have mercy on me, God, according to your faithful love. Wipe away my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Create a clean heart for me, God. Put a new faithful spirit deep within me. Deliver me from violence, God, God of my salvation, so that my tongue can sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will proclaim your praise. You don't want sacrifices. If I gave an entirely burnt offering, you would not be pleased. A broken spirit is my sacrifice, God. You won't despise a heart, God, that is crushed and broken. David talks about being cleansed and renewed from within. He talks about God's spirit as like a grace that he can breathe into his lungs and then breathe back out in return. The thing is, our, our, our voice is not just an external thing. It's, it's connected to our internal. It's the, it's the one way we interact both internally and externally with the world around us in this rhythmic, constant kind of fashion, breathing in and breathing out. It's like the breathing treatments my son is on currently. He uses a nebulizer, and he just finds it hilarious to puff the big puff of smoke out of his nebulizer. He breathes it in and then breathes out whatever's in that stuff. They tell him to brush his teeth afterwards. I'm like, what's in that? And Reagan's like, just put it on his face. It's fine. Okay. All right. Um, but we breathe in and we breathe out. Finally, he says, what is worship really? You know, this is the same King David whose son is going to build the big temple and get us all into all this ritual and, and, for, and festive and formality that we now enjoy today. But, but David rests and realizes, no, I don't think worship is anything about the songs that I sing in church or about the prayers that we pray together or about the, 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 the preaching that we hear. It's, it's not about really any of that. It's ultimately about the life that I live, the way that I breathe outside of this space. Worship to you, God, is a life that is changed on the inside for the better for the outside. It's a life that breathes in grace so it can breathe out grace. It's a life that confesses when we know we've done wrong and our words have been harmful. A life that repents and names the ways in which things will be better and then a life that walks and breathes into renewal and greater health. That's what worship is. And so this week, 
May we breathe deeply the grace of God. Not just so that we could feel at peace or warm fuzzies inside, so that then we could speak and breathe grace into the world around us. A world that needs our truth, a world that needs your goodness, a world sustained by God's grace. May it ever be so. Amen.